welcome to SANS and the conference entitled Dying and Living. And we are fortunate enough today to have with us Katie Mack, who's a cosmologist and a systems professor at North Carolina. Hello, Katie. Hello, how are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Um, I uh, suspect you're gonna give us a little bit of an introduction to who you are and what you do and specifically your just amazing book. <laughs> and I mean, I couldn't put it down. It, it was just unbelievable. Your book, thank The you. End of Everything. Uh, first, I picked it up just because of the title, uh, and then I was so intrigued, I, I couldn't put it down. So anyway, I'll leave you to make a, a presentation about the book and your work okay. in general, and then uh, we'll have a couple of questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really I'm really happy to, uh, to speak to you today. And yeah, so my presentation will be about, um, about the, the topics of the book, which is, you know, the topic is the end of the universe and, and how that'll happen. So um, I'll go ahead and start that. Okay, so, um, so as a cosmologist, my, what I study is the universe as a whole. Um, I study the, the beginning of the cosmos, the end of the cosmos, how it has changed over time. And so this presentation will be about, you know, how does the universe die? What are the, what are the possibilities for that? How are we figuring it out? Um, so when I give this talk, I, I sometimes like to begin with a poem. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. That of course is the famous poem by Robert Frost from 1920. And now we know the answer, the world will end in fire. It'll definitely be fire. In somewhere around a billion years, the sun will have expanded and brightened enough to boil off the oceans of the earth. The earth will be left a charred and lifeless uh, hunk of rock and we will not be living on it. Where we go from there, I don't know. A billion years is a long time. The human species might find ways to survive, to go out into the cosmos, to live in other places, to uh, leave some rem remnant, um, to evolve into something different. But at some point, uh, at some point we get to the question of how does the rest of it end? How does the universe end? And based on what we know right now, we think it probably does. So in the book that I've uh, just written, um, I looked at several different possibilities for how that might happen. I'll talk about four of them here. There's another one in the book um, that you can ask me about later on if you're interested in that. Um, but the scenarios I'll discuss today are the big crunch, the heat death, the big rip, and vacuum decay. And these represent uh, different ways that the universe could evolve into the future and how it could eventually come to an end. Now, just to orient us, we live in a galaxy, uh, the Milky Way galaxy. If you've ever been at a really dark uh, location on a really dark night, you might have been able to see the Milky Way stretching across the sky. This particular view is from the Southern Hemisphere, uh, where you get the best view because you're looking toward the center of the Milky Way galaxy. We live in a, a disc-shaped galaxy. If we could be outside of it, it would look a little bit like this. This is actually the Andromeda galaxy, which is our nearest neighbor large galaxy. Um, but uh, we're living somewhere in the sort of outskirts of a disc-shaped galaxy, similar to this one. And depending on where you are on the Earth, you can see different parts of our galaxy stretched out as a, a band of stars across the sky. We think there are probably somewhere around maybe 400 billion stars in our galaxy. And then as we look out into the cosmos, we see many other galaxies in the universe. This is the, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field image. This picture has about 10,000 galaxies in it. If you could zoom in and look at every one of those little colorful specks, that is a galaxy with its own set of millions or billions or even trillions of stars uh, collected together in, um, you know, gravitationally bound together. And, and these, the stars in those galaxies are, are orbiting the center of those galaxies 
sometimes in complicated ways, similar to how the stars in our galaxy are orbiting our galaxy. So we live in a solar system within a galaxy and the galaxy is one of probably trillions in the universe as a whole, at least in the observable universe. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about, about that later on. Um, so there are, there are all these galaxies out there. And one of the things that we see when we look out into the cosmos is that all of these galaxies are, all these distant galaxies are moving away from each other. Um, we see that the universe is expanding. Galaxies are getting farther and farther apart. And I'll talk more about the expansion of the universe as well. Um, but when we look at these distant galaxies that are, that are moving away from each other as the universe is expanding, there are a couple of things we can learn from that. One is that if the universe is expanding now, it must have been smaller in the past. And so we can extrapolate, okay, if the universe was smaller in the past and everything was closer together, that means that now, right now the universe is expanding, everything's getting farther apart, it's getting less dense, it's getting cooler. In the past, it must have been hotter and denser and in some sense smaller than it, than it is today. And so we can, we can infer that there, there must have been a time when the whole universe was hot and dense. Um, and when we, when we do that, uh, that extrapolation, we, we call that the Big Bang Theory. Just the Big Bang Theory is really just the idea that the universe in the past was smaller and hotter and denser than it is today. The other thing that we see when we look out at these distant galaxies is we see that we're actually looking at these distant galaxies as they were in the past. Um, everything that you look at, you're looking at it as it was in the past because the light from anything you see takes time to get to you. So even if you're looking at something very close to you, the light from that thing takes some time to get to you. So the picture you have of it is a little bit old by the time it reaches you. Now, light travels at about one foot per nanosecond. So if you're looking across the room, you're looking at a few nanoseconds ago. If you look at the sun, you're looking at about eight minutes ago. If you look at another star in our Milky Way, you might be looking at thousands of years ago. If you look at distant galaxies, you're looking at billions of years ago. And we know about how long ago the universe went, was in that hot dense phase. The beginning of the universe was about 13.8 billion years ago. So we can actually look at galaxies that are so far away that their light has taken billions of years to reach us. Now this is a, a, a diagram of kind of how that works. Uh, there's the modern universe where we're looking at things that are fairly nearby, fairly recent. And then as we look farther and farther away, we're looking farther and farther back. So in this image, the, the sort of purple band across the picture is the Hubble ultra deep field. That's the picture I showed you of all those tens of thousands of galaxies. Those galaxies are living in a universe that's only about a half a billion years old. So our universe now is 13.8 billion years old. The, the, the galaxies that we see, the light has been traveling to us for so long that the universe is only about half a billion years old uh, as, as we see those galaxies. Now, what happens if we look farther away than that? Can we look so far away that we're seeing um, before the first galaxies even formed? And the answer is yes. We can look so far away that we're looking so far back in time that we're seeing the universe as it was when the whole universe was hot and dense and just filled with this primordial plasma from the, the moment of, of creation, whatever that was. And we can actually, we can see that every direction we look in the sky, we can look far enough away that we're seeing the early universe, we're seeing the universe as it was during the Big Bang. Now, a lot of people think of the Big Bang as being an explosion from a single point. That's not what we think happened. We think that everywhere in the universe, the universe was hotter and denser and the universe may have always been incredibly large, but it was, it was hot and dense in the, in the beginning everywhere. So even if we look at something very far away, um, in any direction we look, we'll see that the time when the universe was hot and dense and smaller than it is today. And so it's, it's sort of like we have this kind of shell of, of fire surrounding us at the, at the very edges of our vision, where we look far enough away, we see the universe as it was at the very beginning. And of course, we can't see past that because there hasn't been enough time in the universe for light to have reached us from beyond a certain distance. Uh, so there's a distance where it's taken light 13.8 billion years to get to us. 
if there was light coming to us from farther away than that, we wouldn't be able to see it anyway. Um, so there's there's this kind of shell of fire that's, that defines the edges of our of our vision. And what we're seeing when we look at that is really the big bang. We're seeing the beginning of the universe. And we can actually take that light from every direction of the sky and we can map it out onto the into a single image. So if we were to take visible light from every direction of the sky, it would look something like this. We could see the sort of Milky Way stretched across the middle. We're projecting uh, you know, the way that you could project a map of the Earth onto an oval. This is a similar kind of projection. So you can project the, the visible light from everywhere onto, onto an oval like this. And you can do that, you can do the same with uh, microwave light, with the light that, that um, uh, it's a, a kind of electromagnetic radiation, just like visible light, but longer wavelengths, microwave light. And, and you see something like this, it's very uniform. Every direction we look, if we look far enough away, we see this, this background light, the, the microwave light coming from every direction in the sky. And it's about the same temperature, but we can, we can crank up the contrast on these, on these images and we can start to see structure patterns in that background light. This is the cosmic microwave background. This is the light that's left over from the Big Bang. But really it's, it's not just that it's light left over from the Big Bang, it's that every direction we look, we are looking far enough away that we're seeing the Big Bang itself. We're seeing the light from the time when the universe was still on fire. We're seeing parts of the universe that are still on fire. And that light comes to us as microwave radiation and it has some structure to it. And we can, we can uh, crank up the contrast even more and, and look at these, the details of the structure and we start to see patterns. And these patterns are parts of the universe where during that time, the very early time in the cosmos, the universe was a little bit hotter or a little bit cooler, places where there's a little bit higher density and a little bit lower density. And, and the fantastic thing about these kinds of maps is that we can actually look at how the, how the structure was laid out at this very early time. And this is about 380,000 years after whatever the beginning was, but the time when the universe was still full of this hot plasma. And we can take, we can look at the variations in this map and we can, we can give that, the, that data to a computer and tell it, okay, here's the places where the, the gas, this plasma was a little bit hotter and a little bit, or a little bit cooler or a little bit more dense, a little bit less dense. And we can have the computer just use gravity to pull more matter into the places where it's a little denser, less in the places where it's less dense. And as we do that process, we, we see that the, the distribution of galaxies that we see in the sky today perfectly matches what happens when you give that data to a computer and just let time go on, let gravity pull matter together, form stars and galaxies. You get the same patterns, statistically speaking, uh, from starting with that primordial fire and the little fluctuations in the primordial fire and what we see in terms of the distribution of galaxies today. So we really do understand the physics of that to an amazing degree. Um, even though we're, we're looking at something that's the, where the light has been traveling to us for billions of years at, at basically the very edge of the universe, the, the observable universe. The universe itself probably continues on much farther, uh, but there's a limit to what we can see based on how long the light has been traveling. So that's the introduction to where we are in the cosmos right now, where we are in time right now. Um, and that leads us to our first uh, possibility for the end of the universe, because another thing that we can learn by looking at these patterns in the cosmic microwave background is we can learn something about what's in the universe, how it's evolved over time, um, and how it might change in the future. So one possibility for the future of the universe is something called the Big Crunch. And it's a very simple idea. It's been around for a long time. The idea is right now the universe is expanding. Uh, you know, galaxies are getting farther apart from each other, but you know, what would happen if that expansion were suddenly to stop and reverse and galaxies were to start getting closer together again? Um, the reason they might do that is that all the galaxies have gravity and they're all kind of pulling on each other with gravity. And so there's this question of the balance between the initial expansion set off by the Big Bang and the gravity of all the 
galaxies pulling toward each other. And in the big crunch scenario, the gravity wins. So the, the expansion is sort of slowed down by that gravity and then starts to come back together. And so what that would look like would be really interesting. So at some point the galaxies would get closer and closer together and you'd have more collisions and interactions between galaxies. So this is an example of two galaxies that are, are close to each other already in the universe. So they're not moving apart very much because they're already sort of gravitationally connected and they have collided with each other. And in that collision, the stars in each galaxy have been flung around to these giant tails. Um, and this is a galactic merger or a galactic collision. We see these a lot in the universe because there are a lot of galaxies that were just sort of formed near each other. And then they, instead of being pulled apart by the expansion of the universe, they were already close enough that they start interacting and colliding with each other. And there are entire catalogs of these colliding, interacting galaxies where you can see you know, these trails of stars being flung off. And it's a, it's kind of an amazing uh, sight to see. So if the universe were collapsing, then that's the first thing that would happen. The galaxies would collide, stars would be flung out um, and, uh, and everything would get very sort of tangled up and complicated. But the thing is that that's, that's not what would kill the stars. So there's a really fascinating thing that happens when you compress the universe and you compress all the matter and bring the galaxies together. The other thing that happens is that all of the radiation in the universe gets compressed too. So there's the radiation, the microwave background radiation that's left over from the Big Bang, that'll get hotter. So the universe, the sort of ambient temperature of the universe will start to get back to the the temperatures of the early times when the universe was hot and dense because all that's happened there is that it was you know expanded and cooled and then it'll be um it'll be compressed again but also all of the light from all of the stars that have ever shown in the universe all that light will be compressed too and it'll be uh sort of cranked up in intensity cranked up in in frequency it'll become hotter it'll become harder radiation. So the visible light will become ultraviolet light, ultraviolet light will become X-rays, X-rays will become gamma rays, and everything will get much, much hotter and more intense. And so if you are a star hanging out in the universe as the universe is compressing, then what happens to you is that all of that radiation from all of the starlight and everything that's happened in the universe over the course of its life will become so intense that it'll start to ignite the surfaces of stars. And then you get thermonuclear explosions across the surfaces of the stars. And at that point, the universe is really over. So that's one way the universe could end. Now, we think probably it's not very likely to happen that way because as it happens, the expansion of the universe, it looks like that part's gonna win over the gravity. And if that happens, if the expansion wins, if the gravity doesn't slow it down enough, doesn't stop it, and the universe just continues expanding forever, that's when you get a heat death. So again, what happens here is, you know, the universe is expanding, 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 and as it's expanding, it's cooling. And as the expansion goes on, um, there are fewer of those collisions between galaxies. And one of the things that happens when galaxies collide is it sparks New, the formation of new stars by bringing gas together, the gas comes together, it forms new stars, uh, that will stop happening so much. So when the universe becomes more and more, more you know, diffuse, when galaxies get farther and farther apart, there'll be fewer of those collisions and that's already happening. We already see that there are fewer collisions of stars, uh, of uh, galaxies than there used to be. Fewer stars are being formed than, than used to be formed. Um, but something even stranger than that is happening. The, the expansion of the universe is not just not slowing down. Uh, it's not just not reversing, it's actually speeding up. So the galaxies are getting farther apart faster and faster. And that's really strange because when you think about it, the, the two forces that should be at work is one, there was the initial expansion. And then, you know, after that, there should just be the, the gravity pulling everything together. It's kind of like if you throw a ball up into the air, there's the initial sort of kick you give to push the ball up into the air. And then as soon as you let go of it, gravity is pulling it down. The gravity between the ball and the ground are, are pulling together and that's slowing it down as it's moving up. At some point, 
you know, when you throw a ball, it stops uh, and it, it falls back down. If you were able to throw a ball into the air at 11.2 kilometers per second, then it would have enough of a of an initial initial kick that it would it would leave the Earth's atmosphere and it would coast off into space. Um, but uh, but there's nothing that you could do just by throwing a ball that would make it sort of keep going for a little while, slowing down, and then shoot off into space on its own. That's that 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 wouldn't happen. And in the universe, there shouldn't be anything that does that either. But there is something, something has caused the universe to not only keep expanding forever, but speed up in its expansion. Something since the Big Bang has, has kicked in to, to accelerate the expansion of the universe. Now, we don't know what that is. Uh, we call it dark energy. Uh, that's just a term for something that we can't see that's making the universe expand faster. Um, but whatever it is, it's making the, the galaxies get farther apart faster and faster. And it's leading us to the situation where at some point, all the galaxies are gonna be moving apart from each other so quickly that every individual galaxy or, or little group of galaxies will be isolated. So in about a hundred billion years, uh, we will not be able to see other galaxies in the sky. So we could have our Hubble Space Telescope orbiting our planet, taking pictures of, uh, of the sky, and we wouldn't get these images with 10,000 galaxies in them with you know all these amazing interactive galaxies and everything like that uh, we we will get nothing if we, uh, we we will see nothing outside of our own galaxy our own sort of little group of galaxies perhaps um, including the Andromeda galaxy that's already nearby and kind of interacting with us we won't see other galaxies after 100 billion years the night sky will have the stars of our own galaxy and nothing else um, and then eventually, the star formation will will have slowed down so that there are no new stars being formed. In fact, if, if you that's already happening. If you look at the average amount of star formation in the universe right now, um, that peaked around around uh, five seven billion years ago, something like that. There was a peak in the number of stars that were being formed, and um, and that's been decreasing because the universe has been expanding. There are fewer interactions between galaxies, and you can calculate that. If things continue as they, as they seem to be continuing, then something like 90% of all the stars that have ever been formed or ever will be formed have already happened. So from now until the end of time, we're just working on the last sort of five or 10% of stars that the universe will ever get. Uh, so we're 95% done <laughs> with forming stars. And you know, around this time, uh, 100 billion years from now, um, the stars in our own galaxy will be fading, and uh, and this, you know, the stars that we have will start to die. The um, particles will decay, um, and the universe will become a kind of dark, empty place. The reason this is called a heat death is because all that's left in that scenario is the kind of disordered energy from uh, everything that was ever happening in the universe and that disordered energy in physics language is called heat sort of like the waste heat of creation that's all that will be left in the universe it will be a very very dark empty and cold place um, but it'll take a really long time for that process to happen and in some sense it's a fairly gentle <laughs> process because it's just expansion and cooling there is a, a more sort of dramatic possibility it's called the big rip uh, now this is where dark energy is something uh, a little bit more powerful. So dark energy, when it was first sort of suggested, was suggested as what we call a cosmological constant. And it was brought up by Einstein. The idea of a cosmological constant is, okay, all the, all the galaxies in the universe have gravity pulling them together. Um, and something has to be balancing that out. So the reason Einstein came up with the idea of, of a cosmological constant to balance out the gravity of the universe is he didn't know the universe was expanding. So he thought that everything was just stable. And if it were stable, then something would have to keep the galaxies from all collapsing and, and you know merging with each other. Now, at his time, they didn't know that there were galaxies. They thought it was just a bunch of stars, uh, but the same, the same argument works. Um, you'd have to have something that could keep everything from already having collapsed due to gravity. And so he invented this idea of a cosmological constant, which kind of holds, holds up 
the the stars and keeps them from falling together you know so it would keep the galaxies from merging too quickly it would kind of hold everything steady now when we found out that the universe was expanding we threw away the cosmological constant we didn't need that anymore but now that the universe is expanding faster and faster having something that can kind of counteract gravity and push out and and cause more expansion is useful so um, in our standard picture a cosmological constant is just a it's a kind of sort of inherent stretchiness in the universe uh, where every little bit of space has its own bit of kind of stretchiness built in. It's a kind of dark energy, um, but it's something that can make the universe expand faster. And the thing that's constant about the cosmological constant is its density. Um, because every piece of space has some amount of cosmological constant kind of built into it, when there's more space because the universe is expanded, there's more cosmological constant, the density of it stays the same. So uh, density is just sort of mass or, or energy divided by volume. Um, so with regular matter, if you have the same amount of matter and you increase the volume, then the amount of the density goes down. And because the universe is expanding for regular matter, the density is gonna be decreasing over time. For radiation, it actually decreases a little faster because not only is there more space, uh, the radiation is being kind of stretched out as the universe expands, that decrease, decreases its energy. Point is that both matter and radiation go down with time, but a cosmological constant, its density just stays constant even as the universe expands because it's a property of space. And so over time, as the universe evolves forward, you end up with a universe that's basically entirely dark energy, cosmological constant. There's, there's not really anything else left because everything else dilutes away. And so you end up with this universe that's basically just dark energy in the form of a cosmological constant. But there's a possibility for dark energy to be something that's not a cosmological constant. The density is not constant. The density actually increases over time. Uh, that's something we call phantom dark energy. And if the dark energy increases over time, then it doesn't just move galaxies apart from each other. It actually sort of destroys everything from the inside. It tears galaxies apart. It tears solar systems apart. It eventually will tear the entire universe apart. So I want to show a little animation uh, that was put together by NASA uh, as an animation of what dark energy, what, what phantom dark energy would do, what a, a big rip would look like. Um, a bit, the big rip is the, the final sort of tearing apart of space that happens if dark energy goes a little bit haywire and, and gets more powerful over time. So NASA made this animation. It's not very... Um, it's not very detailed, but I, I, I think it's it's a nice uh, a nice way of viewing this. So you know the expansion is happening, galaxies are moving apart, and then oh no, they're they're torn apart from the inside. I'll just show that again. Um, that's that's the kind of thing that that uh, dark energy would do if it if it had this extreme uh, property that it got more powerful over time. Now we think probably the big rip won't happen. There are theoretical reasons to think that it probably can't. And even if it did, we know that it, it really can't happen for at least about 200 billion years because um, that's that's what the data tell us right now that we're at least safe for about 200 billion years. Um, but there is another possibility for the end of the universe that technically could happen sooner. Uh, it probably won't, but we can't rule out the idea that it could happen sort of at any moment and that's vacuum decay. Now. I only have a few minutes left to tell you about this, so I won't go into a lot of detail. Um, but the idea of vacuum decay comes from our studies of particle physics. So this is an image of uh, a collision of particles in the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, what happens with the Large Hadron Collider is you take protons, you smash them together, you look at what happens uh, in that collision, and you learn about how the particles of nature interact with each other, how the forces of nature work, basically how particle physics is, uh, fits together as a theory, what the rules are of, uh, of physics. And by studying these things with things like particle colliders, we can learn whether the, the sort of the laws of physics are stable or not in the sense of whether or not they might change at some point in the future. We know that the laws of physics were different in the very, very first moments of the universe. They went through a change there's a possibility that, that the, the sort of set of laws of physics that they settled on are, are not 
the final one, that there will be another change and that the universe is not stable uh, in the state it's in. And so we can, we can take the data from these particle colliders, we can make plots of, of different possibilities for stability or instability of the universe. And when we do these careful measurements, um, we find that the universe lives right here in this slice of metastability, which means that the universe is kind of stable for now, but it also means that it could change in the future, that, that this instability could take over in the future and, um, and change the laws of physics. And the way that would happen is that there'd be one point in the universe uh, where a bubble would form of a different kind of space, what's called a true vacuum. And then inside that bubble, you'd have different laws of physics, different constants of nature, different relationships between particles, different fundamental forces. And you would not be able to live inside that bubble because your particles wouldn't hold together anymore. And that bubble would expand out at, the sp at about the speed of light, which means that if you're standing nearby, uh, there's no way you're gonna see it coming. <laughs> because if something's moving the speed of light, any information you might get from it will arrive at you at the same time as that bubble. Um, the way it would happen is that that bubble would form due to a quantum event. Uh, called, it's called a quantum tunneling event, a transition in the Higgs field, which is this sort of energy field that pervades all of space. At one point, randomly, without warning, this transition would occur, create the bubble. The bubble would expand out about the speed of light and just destroy everything. Um, and I just want to uh, say a, a little bit about there was a there was a paper that was studying this in the, in 1980 where they they calculated that this bubble would form and that the space inside the bubble um, not only would be a space where we couldn't live but would also anything that ended up in that space would gravitationally collapse immediately so you would you would end up in that space your molecules would fall apart and then you would collapse into a black hole. Um, and uh, they did this calculation of, of this happening and they wrote a little paragraph about it um, that, uh, that I think is a really beautiful little piece of physics poetry. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read you that paragraph. So they've just done this calculation, found that vacuum decay, if it happened, would not only destroy you, but then collapse you into a black hole. And they say, this is disheartening. The possibility that we are living in a false vacuum has never been a cheering one to contemplate. Vacuum decay is the ultimate ecological catastrophe. In a new vacuum, there are new constants of nature. After vacuum decay, not only is life as we know it impossible, so is chemistry as we know it. However, one could always draw stoic comfort from the possibility that perhaps in the course of time, the new vacuum would sustain, if not life as we know it, at least some structures capable of knowing joy. This possibility has now been eliminated. So I don't think we should worry about vacuum decay. Every time I give this talk, um, people get concerned about vacuum decay because it's uh, it's this you know sudden thing that you wouldn't see coming. It would destroy everything. And there are several reasons we shouldn't worry about vacuum decay. One is that based on our calculations, it would probably take so long in the future, it would be trillions and trillions and trillions of years before we expect this to happen, uh, based on our understanding of the probabilities of these events occurring. Uh, another reason is that, you know, obviously there's nothing you could do about it. You wouldn't feel it, you wouldn't see it coming, no one would miss you. Um, but the, the main reason is that um, we, we don't know enough about the universe to say that, uh, that, that it should definitely occur. When we, when we do these calculations of, uh, of vacuum decay, we are basing it on what we call the standard model of particle physics that includes you know, all the particles we know about, protons and electrons and, and the, the Higgs boson and all of these, these particles we've ever detected in any of these particle colliders. And we know that most of the universe is not that stuff. Most of the universe is dark energy, which I've said, we don't know what that is. Uh, a big slice of the universe is dark matter, which is a kind of invisible stuff that, that holds galaxies together. And then there's this little 5% slice in which lives the entire standard model of particle physics, all of the particles you've ever detected in an experiment, everything we, we really understand. And so there's this huge mystery of what is the universe made of? How does it fit together? 
And all of the inferences we make about, you know, the, the stability of our vacuum that we live in or, or the future evolution of the universe uh, rely on some assumptions about all of these mysteries uh, in the universe. And so what we really need to do to know how the universe will end is to understand dark matter, understand dark energy, understand those very first moments of the universe. And uh, that's, that's kind of where we're, we're headed now as a field in physics. We're trying to figure out those, those last few pieces of the puzzle, which are really most of the universe. So that's it. Uh, I will uh, answer some questions now. Well, thank you, Katie. Uh, I mean, I get mesmerized by all of it. And uh, good to know that uh, three out of four, we don't have to worry at least for a hundred billion years. Ago. <laughs> yes. Uh, vacuum uh, decay once in a while, I wake up in the morning and, and say, oh, it hasn't happened yet. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and, and it's good to hear that you feel it's probably not going to happen. There was one yeah. thing you mentioned in the book that you have not mentioned in your talk, and that's the mm -hmm. uh, ekpyrotic. Ekpyrotic, uh, yeah, model. Ekpyrotic. Yeah. So that's a kind of bouncing cosmology. So in the book, I talk about a few different possibilities for bouncing or cyclic cosmologies where you would have an end of the universe that sparks the beginning of a new universe. So ekpyrotic cosmology is one where you'd have a bit of contraction of the universe and then a new universe would come out of that. There are a couple of ways that can happen. The first, uh, the first proposal for that was actually sort of parallel universes coming together and then creating a new big bang and, and then coming apart again and, and doing that over and over again. Um, there's a new version where it's just a, it's a sort of more abstract idea, but, but the universe contracts a little and then, uh, and then sparks a new big bang. There are also possibilities where you have a heat death that leads to a new big bang. There are a few, a few different cyclic cosmologies and, and those are very intriguing because they present the possibility that something could live on after our universe and that even maybe some, some uh, sort of remnant of our cosmos, some, some bit of information from our cosmos could survive into the new, into the new uh, cycle. So those are all a little bit more speculative and a little bit more complicated. Uh, but if you're interested, there's, there's a lot of information about that in the book. Yeah, I, I encourage anybody to look into it. It's, uh, and, and that's actually, that's why I brought it up. It's uh, my favorite, uh, you know, you have it in Hinduism mm -hmm. and some other, uh, um, you know, religious or spiritual uh, uh, frameworks. Uh, so, you know, I don't count it out. And uh, it seems like there's a lot of cyclicality in the universe mm -hmm. uh, anyway. And um, so we'll, we'll wait and see, maybe we won't be around, but our descendants. Uh, now, uh, the, the one picture that I've never uh, forgotten since I first saw it is the background radiation. Yeah. And um, yeah. really, that, that was everything that was contained in the universe. With other words, it has to contain us as well as human beings. Well, well, the background radiation, we're looking at a time, really a long time before we existed. So it, it contains the stuff that will become us. That's what I mean. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so one of the things that that's fascinating about uh, about the the early universe is uh, you've probably heard this uh, this uh, idea that we are made of star stardust, right? right? So, right. so when a star when a massive star dies, it produces heavy elements like um, like you know carbon and oxygen and, and gold and all of these uh, all of these elements that that we see you know the Earth is made of. Um, and then we are, we are made of those things. So the, the reason carbon exists is because stars have died in the past and we are made of a lot of carbon and, and, and other things. But most of, the, most of the atoms in your body are actually hydrogen. And hydrogen isn't made in stars. Hydrogen was made in the first few minutes of the universe in the Big Bang process. So that, that sort of fiery plasma universe in the very beginning that's where hydrogen formed. So most of the atoms in your body actually come from the Big Bang itself. They've, they've been around since the first, the first few minutes of the universe. Yeah, I mean, fascinating. And even there, there are some uh, parallels in some of the tradition, the Eastern traditions, 
uh, you know, they, they proclaim that uh, human beings are also Atman, uh, are everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, one thing that I always wondered about is, uh, as far as I understand, uh, an atom has a nucleus and then electrons, uh, but the space with them is like enormously compared to the size. So yeah. um, at the end of the day, are we more space than anything else? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So, so you know, the particles that the particles that an atom is made of, um, the prot protons are very very small, and we we have uh, we have ways of measuring the sort of the size of a proton. And an electron doesn't seem to really have a size at all. It's a it's a you know has you can't really measure a size of an electron, but they're they're bound together by electromagnetic forces, you know, um, electric charges. The electron is negatively charged, the proton is positively charged, so they they stick together. Um, but uh, but there's you can't really interact directly. Uh, you can't really touch any of those things. So when you touch something, what's really happening is that the electromagnetic, the sort of electrostatic forces. The, the repulsion of the electrons in the thing you're touching are, are pushing against the thing against your hand just with electric repulsion. So you're not actually touching anything, but um, because because those uh, those particles are um, you know their 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 influences through the electromagnetic fields. So. Yeah, there's there's a lot of space in between. There's there's a sort of uncertainty about where the particles really are, and you're not you're not really nothing is really solid. Everything is is kind of held together by by electric forces, electromagnetic forces, and when you interact with things, you're interacting with those electromagnetic forces. And so so you know um, nothing is you know everything is really made of of a, a more uh, diffuse stuff than you, than you might think. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's an endlessly fascinating subject. So would you say that human beings emerged out of the universe rather than coming into the universe? Yeah, I mean, we are we are built from the stuff of the universe. You know, we are we are built from the, the hydrogen that was formed in the in the earliest moments of the, of the cosmos from the, the ash from dead stars. Like we are, we, we have emerged from, from the earth, you know, but we, we are an emergent phenomenon. We are not something separate, but, um, but yeah, I mean, and that's one of the amazing things about cosmology as well is that, you know, we learn a lot about the, the universe as a whole by studying the, the properties of, of atoms and molecules and particles and, and the, the tiniest, tiniest things that are inside of us, we, we learn about the cosmos by studying, by studying those, those smallest things um, and also by looking out into the cosmos and looking back into the depths of time. So there's, there's this huge, huge range of scales uh, when you're learning about the, the, the history and future of the universe. Uh, if we have the time, I have about three more questions. How much time sure. do we have, David? No answer. So I'll just go for it. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Uh, in chapter seven, you write that uh, there is a possible communication between multiple universes through gravitational waves, which I find mm. so, uh, very fascinating. Uh, and I wonder, uh, do you think it's possible that human brains might be able to communicate other than through our senses? So gravitational waves are a kind of special case. Um, they are waves in space time. So they're actually like sort of the distortions of space itself. And, um, and we're able to pick those up. We're able to, to detect those with very sophisticated experiments. Um, some of the most complicated, uh, precise measurements have ever been done. Uh, have been done to detect the the existence of gravitational waves, and and those those could pass in principle between universes if we had universes that were separated by uh, by this extra space, this, this other sort of spatial dimension, a direction that we can't mm -hmm. perceive. Um, but when it comes to uh, to you know how we communicate as people uh, through our senses, um, there's there's kind of there's there's a limited number of, of things that that can interact with with the human brain in a way that that uh, could be detected 
by by senses or anything like that. Um, and you know, we interact by picking up electromagnetic signals basically through our through our eyes or interacting with chemicals through our our other senses. Um, and that's all that's all chemistry and, and electromagnetism. Um, and there are there are kind of there are pretty strong limits on how other forces could interact with us. So so we we don't have the the ability to pick up gravitational waves, although we we can sense uh, you know gravity. But the kinds of gravitational waves that that we can detect with these experiments are uh, like changing something at the scale of a thousandth the size of a proton and that's there's there's way more motion in, in us than than that scale um and then there's there are other forces in nature that are sort of smaller um uh sort of smaller scales that that don't travel you know long distances so i think one of the things that the studying particle physics tells you is that in order to um the in order to find any kind of new like fields or forces or something like that uh you would need such incredibly sophisticated equipment uh that the chance of them actually interacting with humans uh is just is just really small <laughs> so so i you know i think that that if you're someone who's interested in um you know sort of uh, different kinds of perception uh, I think studying part particle physics uh, makes that seem a lot less likely <laughs> um, because because we we've been we've done so many incredibly precise measurements on on all of the kind of ways that energy can can move through the universe. Thank you. Um, here's a question my friend begged me to ask you, uh, and that is uh, the second law of thermodynamics suggests that we're heading for the end of the universe via heat death. Mm -hmm. uh, and his question was, is entropy a result or byproduct of an expanding universe? So entropy is a basic property of the universe. I think it, it's, uh, you know, the the, so entropy is just is a, another term for disorder, basically. And the second law of thermodynamics says that entropy has to increase over time in a closed system. Um, so that's why uh, if that's why um, you know uh, you can't have a perpetual motion machine because there'll always be some energy loss through friction, and it's why uh, you can't have a perfectly efficient motor uh, because you'll always be contributing to some disorder, and and things will be less uh, you know less efficient. Um, but uh, but it, in the universe. Um, we think that the universe also has this property that the end, that disorder increases over time, which means that that everything will decay in the end, and you will reach this heat death where you've reached the sort of maximum entropy state, where kind of nothing more can happen because once you've got maximum entropy, no more processes can happen that can produce entropy, and so you're kind of you kind of run out of things that can happen. Um, but I don't think it's really connected to the expansion of the universe because if you if the universe contracted, you know, if you if we were headed toward a big crunch, um, which which is unlikely but could still happen if dark energy changes how it acts or if we have one of these cyclic cosmologies, the entropy would still be increasing toward the future. Um, so it's you wouldn't reverse that process. You wouldn't go to smaller entropy in the future. Um, it would still be the case that, you know, if you're compressing the universe and, and heating everything up, it still creates more and more disorder. Uh, so it's not the expansion that causes that. It's it's just a property of sort of how we, we think it's one of the most fundamental laws of physics that the entropy can only increase into the future. Um, but it does lead to some weird consequences. Uh, I discussed in the book how um, you, can, you can end up in this sort of heat death universe where the, there's no more there's no more arrow of time because once you've reached maximum entropy, we think that time is sort of the the direction of time is sort of defined by the direction toward more disorder, more entropy. And if the entropy is maximum, then there's no more you can't go forward into more entropy. And so time stops having meaning. It's a very strange uh, scenario. Yeah, and, and last time I checked, there is really no now in the universe. Uh, yeah. You know, it's uh, a different time at any point in the universe. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. The concept of now doesn't make any sense in a relativistic <laughs> yeah. universe, which is very, very strange as well. It's very hard to wrap your head around that one. Yeah. Um, now, I, something that uh, you know has plagued human beings forever, and that is trying to find some meaning and purpose in the universe. Yeah. Uh, and I, I would like to hear your uh, reflections on the statement. Uh, it seems that we can't detect any meaning in the universe objectively, but that subjectively we seem to be experiencing meano, meaning on a daily basis. Mm. Right. So, so one of the things that one of the things that I I really wrestled with in researching and writing this book is that you know if the universe is going to end. Um, then there will be some point at which nothing we've done will have mattered, right? Or, or will matter, right? Like, there, like everything will be erased. All of our knowledge will be erased. All of the history of our past deeds will be erased. And so there will be a point at which we have no legacy and also at which nothing matters anymore, right? Because it's all forgotten. And, and what does that mean for, for finding meaning in, in, in life and in existence? What does it mean if, if, you know, there's no sort of final reckoning where it's all written down if, if it just fades away and, and ends. Um, and one of the things I did in, in the course of writing the book was I, I went around and I talked to other cosmologists about how they think about this question. What does it mean to them that the universe will end someday? And how do they wrestle with that possibility that we have no legacy, that there's no intrinsic, you know, or, or extrinsic meaning to the universe? Um, and there were a lot of different answers. And, and some people said that they find it very depressing, the idea that the universe will end and there will be no trace of us. And, and some found it quite freeing, the idea that we're, we're temporary, um, that we're just a little blip and that's the way it should be. Uh, and for me, I think what, what, I, what I found was that I thought that um, it really highlighted that we need to find our own meaning. We need to, we need to have some sense of meaning that is uh, independent of the future that doesn't rely on somebody coming along and saying, well, it's all, you know, wrapped up and that was great. And here's what it all meant. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, we need, we need to have something that is, that is uh, in the moment that, that we, that we can uh, sort of understand and have, um, have some relationship to that, that doesn't rely on anything external uh, or anything in the future, because there may be no future. We may, you know, be destroyed in, in a vacuum decay event, and then, you know, but the, but there still should be some way that we give ourselves a sense of meaning, and I think that we need to we need to find that uh, for ourselves. Yeah, I suppose it would be very hard to live with uh, the notion that there is no meaning. Um, but uh, I think the way I hear you talk about it seems that you separate objective and subjective. So objective, there may be no meaning, but subjective, it's potent with meaning. Yeah, I mean, I think I think meaning is a is a human construct, you know, in the sense like uh, I don't think I don't think the universe has an opinion about it. Um, yeah. and so, <laughs> and so you know, so I think that is inherently subjective. But but I don't think that makes it not real you know I, I think that that uh we experience the universe um as uh as creatures living within it as creatures built out of it um you know as creatures who uh are are this the an emergent property of the universe and so so how we construct meaning is is meaningful it is important and um and i think that that we uh we have a responsibility to uh, you know, to, to do that for ourselves, because we are, we are here, we have this amazing existence, it's not going to last forever, even in 100 billion years, it'll all be very, very different, no matter what happens. Um, and so, you know, we, we have the opportunity to, to find meaning for ourselves and to, and to live uh, in this universe and appreciate this universe while it exists. And I think that's an important thing to do, because otherwise, uh, you know, we, otherwise we, we are, are squandering that opportunity, I think. Well, Katie, I have to say it's very meaningful for me to have this conversation <laughs> with you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so last question, and this is a quote from uh, Roger Penrose. Mm. Uh, 
I claim that there is a observation of Hawking radiation. Mm. The Big Bang was not the beginning. There was something before the Big Bang and something is what we will have in our future. So he's referring to some research um, looking for patterns in that cosmic microwave background, that, that image I showed you of the little splotches across the sky, the, the very earliest light in the universe. Um, his, uh, so, so the, the claims, the, the, uh, the observations that he's, he's done and the, um, the claims of, uh, of what he's seen, uh, that's, that's still uh, quite hotly debated in the astrophysics community. There are very, there are very uh, sort of heated arguments between different groups about how to analyze that data and whether or not the signals that he claims he sees are really strong evidence for that, that early phase. So I think that the jury's out on that. I think that um, you know, over time, we're gonna continue to study that and continue to look for, for evidence of this, the possibility of, of, of earlier universes and, and the possibility of future universes. And, and I don't think that that's a settled question at all, um, but it is, it is an interesting possibility. Um, but I also think that, um, I think that, that uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't think we should get too hung up on the idea that, you know, that there will be something in the future and, and therefore it's all okay. I think we, we, we should probably, you know, settle up with the idea that, that maybe this is all there is and, um, and see what the implications of that are. Well, um, I, I hope uh, on the oscillating universe, so we can have this conversation <laughs> again in, in a couple of million years, billion years. <laughs> sure. Thank you That'd so much. Fun. It, it Thank was you. really a delight. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.